Hi and welcome to Physics High and today I want to give you an overview of Module 4 which is part of the New South Wales curriculum in the Preliminary Physics course. And today's topic will be electricity and magnetism. Now before I start, please remember to like, share and subscribe and I would really value your support by buying me a coffee. The link is in the description below. Now this particular topic seems to be two distinct topics. That is one of electricity and one of magnetism. In actual fact, they are two sides of the same coin, but that is actually explored in greater detail in the module six, electromagnetism in the HSC course. And that's why these two topics are placed in this particular module. Now this topic is divided up into three key inquiry questions. The first two deals with the idea of electricity and the last one deals with magnetism. And the first inquiry question asks, how do charge objects interact with other charge objects and neutral objects. Now, in essence, this is often referred to as the concept of electrostatics, and so that's what I'll call it. The second inquiry question now deals with what we often refer to as circuit electricity. And so the question in this case asks, how do the processes of the transfer and transformation of energy occur in electrical circuits? And so, as I stated, I'm gonna call it electrical circuits. And the last one, of course, is on magnetism. And the inquiry question in this case states, how do magnetized and magnetic objects interact? Now that we have an understanding of the fact that charges move within electric fields, we now, in a simplified way, look at electrical circuits. And we, in essence, want to look at two situations. We want to look at how we measure electrical circuits, and then what we want to do is expand on that and we look at what we refer to as complex circuits. Now, when we're talking about measuring electrical circuits, in this case, we're just looking at simple circuits. I'll just put a diagram over here on the side here. We have our power supply or our voltage source. We have a simple resistance like so. We obviously have already referred to the idea of a voltage. And so we have the idea that we apply a certain voltage. We measure that by using a voltmeter. And then we can also measure, and I'll call this dash one, and this call this number two. And over here, I have the voltage of the energy transformation that occurs in that resistor. And so we already have the concept of voltage. But what we end up getting here is an electrical current. And so now we have a current flow and it's always drawn from the positive plate to the negative plate. That's a conventional current. And so I'll put the value I here. And so now we have I here. Now, what happens here, of course, is, is that that current is determined by not only the work done per unit charge, which is our voltage that is applied, but we also have the idea here that the fact is that this resistance here slows that current down. So now we end up getting resistance. And so as a result, we now can form a relationship between these three things. That is the current that ends up being generated in my simple circuit is actually proportional to the voltage and inversely proportional to the resistance. Now, this often is referred to as the concept of Ohm's law, but I want to make a slight comment here about making sure we've got a correct understanding of Ohm's law. All this states is that the current in any particular resistor is determined by the voltage applied to that resistor and the value of that resistor. And now if I were to graph that, let's say across a simple circuit like this, and I'm going to deliberately put the voltage on my y-axis and my current on the x-axis. Normally in an experiment, I'd reverse it because current is actually my dependent variable. But if I were to graph that, I might get a graph that looks something like this. As my voltage increases, I might find that my current increases, but it actually does not increase at a constant rate. Now in this case, this is still always true. Whatever the re resistance is, is determined by the voltage, let's say at that point, and the current at that point, or the voltage at this point, and the current at this point. You can see what's happening here is that the resistance 
resistance is actually the slope of the line. And in this case, my resistance is increasing as my current is increasing. And this was developed by George Ohm in the 18, early 1800s. But Ohm's law actually goes a little step further. It says that in some circuits with some resistors, then what we get is actually we get a linear line. And that is the resistance is constant regardless of the voltage and the current as a result. That is actually Ohm's law. And that basically says that R is constant for all situations. That highlights the point, the fact that we can have resistors that are ohmic resistors. That is, that remain constant relatively through a large range for any current that it experiences. But in actual fact, the resistance may change. And so bulbs, like electrical light bulbs, are what we refer to as non-ohmic resistors. That is, their resistance actually changes as the current increases. And that's one of the reasons because of that is that the wire that may be contained in that bulb actually heats up. And that's a factor that determines the resistance. And so the resistance actually increases as it starts to heat up. So let's then clarify. Basically, it says that R is equal to V over I, which is constant. That is basically the case where we have Ohm's law. Finally, how we also can measure is that, well, there's an energy transformation taking place here. We have charges that have a certain energy per unit charge. We have a certain number of charges, which is the rate of flow of charge, which is our electrical current. And then if we understand the fact that there's an energy transformation, we have the concept of power and in this case the power transformation that takes place which is obviously the amount of energy transferred per unit time you can then derive that in terms of voltage and current and you get vi or you get i squared r or you get v squared over r and so now we have the concept of electrical power that is the energy transformation and that ties us back to the inquiry question because it is all about energy we then move on to complex circuits. And it really is understanding these principles, but now in two key types of circuits. And the first is our series circuits. And then what we have is our parallel circuits. Now in our series circuit, we may have a voltage supply like so, and then we may have a resistance. In this case, I have three resistances that are referred to as being in series. I can then have also a circuit where I have a resistance like so, and then in parallel, I have another resistance and let's say I add a third one like so. And in essence, what we want to look up now is what we call Kirchhoff's rules or Kirchhoff's laws. And Kirchhoff's laws basically in some respects is a simplification of understanding the conservation of energy. And that Kirchhoff's law says that the total voltage in a circuit is zero. And so we have an applied voltage here, which we call VT, but then we have a loss of voltages in our particular three resistors. And what that is saying is that the total value is zero. And what that means is that VT ends up being equal to sum of the individual voltages. However, the current remains constant. Within a parallel circuit, circuit, we now have the Kirchhoff's law of currents. In this case, what we say is again, the current, basically in essence, it's about all currents leading to a point basically add up to zero. But in essence for us, our total current that is in the circuit is now equal to the currents in the individual parts of my parallel circuit. And so what we end up getting is I1 plus I2 plus I3 equaling the total current in the circuit. My voltage now across each of these individual resistors is also is remaining constant. And so that's a simplification of understanding series and parallel circuits. And once you know the voltage and current in any particular resistor, you can then of course also determine the electrical power or the amount of energy that's being transferred per unit time. Now, understand that this topic is a simplification and it ends up being far more complex in reality in terms of understanding circuits. So let me just say there's lots more to these models to go. Well, I hope that has helped you understand electricity and magnetism. Please remember to like, share and subscribe. And please put a comment down below if this has been helpful for you. And remember, if you'd like to support the work that I do, maybe buy me a coffee. The link is in the description below. My name is Paul from Physics High. Take care and bye for now.